Our text today is taken from the sixth chapter of the letter to the Hebrews, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do, if God permit, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. For the earth, which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus call, is out then to go on to maturity, to move along, the people of God. And here were a group of people here in in this under consideration here who were interesting in that respect. We can learn something about them. It is said that they have become as such as had need of milk and not strong meat, indicating a regression in their spiritual life. They had gone backwards. They had grown back in a sort of a reversion into the infancy stage. And here they were doing what people in that condition always do. They were examining again the foundations. Was I really saved? Was I really sincere? Did I ever really mean it? Is the Bible true? Have I made a mistake? All of these questions, you see, of re-examining the foundations. And thought that they were doing right, but you see they weren't doing right because the writer said, now now let's get it clear here, that these are Christian people. These are Christian people we're talking about. Now some people, because of their Calvinistic leanings and their inability to understand these passages, have tried to say that these weren't Christian people. But that is a matter of blindness and darkness which only adds to the confusion. Listen to these people who were once enlightened. And that word once is the Greek word hapax, and it means one time only. It's the same word that is used when it says the truth which was once delivered to the saints, once to die. It is a one time only thing. It is a conclusive thing. In other words, to read it in its proper linguistic form, we were say to those who were once for all, one time only, enlightened. That's the thrust of what it's saying. And have tasted of the heavenly uh, gift. And that's a a rather long and involved Greek word, guomai, and it means to eat, to experience, to feed upon, you see. That doesn't sound like someone who's just been standing indecidedly and trying to make up uh, their mind. And then we have it said that they were partakers of the Holy Ghost. This is the same word that we find in the second chapter in the 14th verse when it said Christ became a partaker of flesh and blood. Does that mean he just thought about it? That maybe the Sabellianist is right, that Christ only appeared to be human. He never really was. It gave the appearance of being, but it wasn't really so. We don't believe that. We say, no, he was a partaker of flesh and blood. That means he participated in it, which is exactly what it means to share, to associate The word means a fellow or a partner. These were partners with the Holy Ghost. These were sharers in the Holy Ghost. These were partakers. They had tasted of the heavenly gift. They had been partakers of the Holy Ghost. They had eaten of the good word of God. They had experienced the powers of the good worlds to come. These were no near misses. If this kind of language doesn't identify a Christian, then we might as well say that we can't identify a Christian with language. If somebody can have experienced the Holy Ghost, have been a part 
partaker in the word of God and the world to come and have been once and for all enlightened without being a Christian, then we might as well forget about trying to say anything with words. Because if words don't mean anything, then why do we even bother? Granted, there is room for interpretation, but there is distortion cannot take place under the guise of interpretation. These were children of God. These were children of God. There can be no question about it. And so that's what we're talking about. And we're saying to these people, let's go on. Let's go on to maturity. And let's don't try to lay again the foundation. And what is the foundation? Well, repentance from dead works and faith toward God. You say, well, that's a Jewish repentance. That's a different repentance than we talk, call upon people today. Oh, no, it's not. No, it's not. That's exactly what we call upon people to do, to repent and be converted. We're not talking about some shallow linguistic trick. You don't think, you don't do anything that might represent efforts. You just do nothing at all. You just say, I'll take it. And that's all you can do because anything else would be a work. See, nonsense, nonsense. This is calling upon an exercise of the free will to turn away from the lost condition and the hopeless confidence in ourselves and make a decision to come to God and to be changed and to be a different person. That is what repentance is, and it's always implied, and it is not a work. It is not a work. It's an act of faith. And these kinds of wranglings over repentance being a Jewish word because it calls upon us for, to do works are unenlightened things. They are outside the framework and the context and the mainstream of Christian thought. They are intellectual wranglings of uh, unenlightened minds who don't get hold of reality. Men are called upon to repent and to be converted. And any gospel message that calls for repentance, or calls for people to make a decision for Christ that leaves out of it repentance and the desire to be changed is not Christian conversion, you see. That's what the whole thing is all about. We're lost and we're sinners and we're without hope and we've got to abandon all confidence in ourselves and our own good works and we've got to turn to God and we've got to be changed. That's what he's talking about. Repentance from dead works and faith toward God is as good a terminology as any to describe the New Testament appeal part of the foundation, and of the doctrines of baptisms. There are two doctrines of baptisms which are fundamental. One is that mystical baptism of the Holy Ghost that takes us out of our lost condition and puts us into the family of God and performs the miracle of death and new life and a new creature. The other is that very primary, however, uh, following doctrine of the baptism into water, which is calling upon Christian people to follow hard upon the heels of this conviction to carry out this matter of conversion, to give up their lives to themselves and to live the new life, to die to themselves and to be washed clean with the water of the word through obedience to it and to live a new life. You always find this New Testament baptism in close relationship to repentance. No example in the New Testament of a man who came to the Lord and five years later decided to be baptized. Now, I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm saying there's no example of it in the scriptures, which indicates that this is one of the fundamental doctrines of the faith. This thing of what are you going to do with your life? You're going to become a Christian and then you're going to live the Christian life. That is a fundamental doctrine. That's part of the very basic thing that we tell people. If we don't tell them that, we should tell them that. And Paul said, I always did this. I don't know who these people are that are accusing me, but I always taught men that they should repent, and then that having repented, they should bring forth fruits meet for repentance. I always told them that. Anybody says, I didn't is a liar. So said the Apostle Paul. He taught them the doctrine of New Testament baptism, of dying to themselves and living to God as part of the fundamental part of the foundation. And then another foundation and fundamental doctrine is the doctrine of the laying on of hands. You knew that, didn't you? You were fully familiar with that. You knew that very basic thing in the gospel is the doctrine of laying on of hands, and you all know what it means, don't you? You see, sometimes the problem is that we think we are 
mature people who've gone away backwards, and then all of a sudden we realize to our chagrin that we don't even know all the fundamentals. Here is a fundamental truth of the faith that may escape some people. What does it mean? Well, I'm not going to go into all the scriptures that talk about the doctrine of laying on of hands. There's a number of them. I've jotted them down here. I'll just tell you what they are, just so you'll know. They're it, it, Acts uh, 6, 6, Acts 8, 9, Acts 19, 11, 1 Timothy 4, 14, uh, uh, second, uh, 1 Timothy 5, 22, 1 Timothy uh, 4, 15, 2 Timothy 1, 6. That many scriptures in the Bible that talk about the doctrine of laying on of hands. If you read all of those and you studied them, you would discover this that the gifts, the Holy Ghost and the gifts of the Holy Ghost were conferred upon penitent people through the hands of the apostles. That's what you'd find. You'd find that when Paul and Barnabas were separated from the church, they never went out until the leaders of that church in Antioch laid their hands upon them and conferred upon them the gifts and the authority and sent them out. And you would find that seldom did any new group of people receive the Holy Ghost without the laying on of the hands of the apostles. We read that in the uh, sixth chapter of Acts, in the sixth verse, that when it was known that the people in Samaria had received the gospel and repented, the apostles were sent down there and they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. And you would find, if you read this, that Timothy received his gifts for the ministry by the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. And you would find that later on other gifts were conferred upon Timothy by laying, the laying on of the hands of Paul. And if you wanted to study in the 19th chapter of Acts, you would find that great God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Now what does this all mean? It means that the work is committed to men and that it is not so mystical that it has no physical aspects. Not only is there control in the church, but there is reality to this thing of the kingdom of God. You go up to somebody you love and you put your arm around them and you convey that love and you convey that warmth through the things you do, the physical things you do. And we are commanded in the scripture to show love in physical ways. You stand over there and say, I'm an ascetic. I love you, but I'm not going to smile. I'm not going to reach out my hand toward you. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit over here and be mental about it. Well, that gets to be a pretty cold and indifferent world, you see. And it doesn't work really very well either because we are emotional and physical and expressive people. But some people have become so sterile and so clinical and so cosmetic and so intellectually stuffy in their approach to the ministry that the thought of God working through them personally to convey the gifts of the Spirit to anyone else is frightening. It's almost too real to be holy. Well, you see, if your holiness lacks reality, it isn't holiness at all. It's just mere mental concepts that are barren. The faith is for people, and the doctrine of the laying on of hands is one of the fundamentals. Isn't that what it says? Not laying again the foundation one of those foundation stones is the doctrine of the laying on of hands. And maybe we can't exhaust that this morning. Maybe we ought to think a little about that. Maybe part of our problem is we haven't even accepted all of the foundation so that we can't go on and grow. And then we read about uh, the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. We are mostly all convinced of that. And of eternal judgment. Unfortunately, in so-called fundamentalism today, because of intellectual problems, because of irreconcilable differences between Calvinism and Arminianism and on and on, there is some doubt about eternal judgment. There are some people in the church who are actually teaching under the flag of fundamentalism that Christian people will not stand in judgment. But you don't have to read the Bible very far to find out the fallacy of that kind of thinking. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ that every one of us, every one of us may give an account of what we have done in our body, whether it's good or bad. And every man will receive. In the book of Revelation said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and judgment was held. And the books were opened, you see. There is a doctrine of eternal judgment. Never doubt for a moment 
all other things aside, and the doctrines of grace and forgiveness notwithstanding, never doubt for a moment that you will stand in judgment before God. If you don't know that, you ought to know it. And if anybody is teaching you that you won't, he's teaching you falsely, he's teaching you erroneously, and he's doing you a disservice. You will give an account, and so will I. We will do it. There is no doubt about it. Now, of course, the doctrines of grace and forgiveness bear hard upon that, and we can be forgiven, and sins can be blotted out, and the righteousness of Christ can replace the unrighteousness of man, and all that has great meaning with respect to the judgment of God, but it doesn't mean there isn't going to be one. And it doesn't mean you're not going to be there, because even if we're not going to be there with respect to justification, we're going to be there with respect to sanctification. The righteousness of Christ has to have outworking in our life, or it isn't there. We are not sanctified if we don't do those good works that God has before ordained that we should walk in them. We hear the book of Ephesians quoted so often, we are For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But they don't go on to say, because we are his workmanship created in Christ unto good works that God has before ordained that you should walk in them. And if you want to make a search of the scriptures, you will find that the subject of good works was one of the principal themes of all of the apostles, every one of them, Paul included. And the contradictions that we imagine are there are not there. The contradictions are not in the scriptures. They are in our own mind. There is no contradiction between grace and the need for the righteous works of Christ in the lives of God's people through the mediums of our body and our free will. That is a biblical doctrine. And not only is it a biblical doctrine, but we'll give an account of how well we have comprehended it and handled it. We will give an account. There is a judgment. We will be in it. You will be in it, whether you think you will or not. So think about that doctrine of the judgment. But those are fundamentals, and these people, at least, had already resolved that in their mind. They knew about these fundamental doctrines. What they had done now was they had gone back to them and began to re-examine them, thinking that maybe that would solve the problem. Maybe if I go back and re-examine whether I was really saved or not, maybe that will solve the problem. And the apostle said, how is he going to do it? How is he going to solve the problem? That's doubt. That's all that is. Let's say that a child is not functioning properly, and we say, well, maybe if we stuffed him back in his mother and let him come out all over again, maybe that'd solve the problem. We say, that's disgusting. That is repulsive thought. Well, that's what the apostle said. It's a disgrace. It's an open shame. This thing of examining the new birth again is a degrading of God and his truth. It's a humiliation of Christ and his cross. We are making the same kind of degrading and distasteful Uh, comments about the new birth when we talk like that as we are about the first birth when we talk as we were just talking. The same kind of nonsense and distasteful talk which we don't even like to hear, which doesn't even conjure up good images. That's what we're doing when we talk about the possibility of someone who was once and for all born into the family of God maybe needing to re-examine the foundations, maybe needing to be born again, again, you see. When we talk about being born again, that's wonderful talk. When we talk about being born again, again, that is mockery, it's sacrilege, it's blasphemy, it is distasteful altogether, and it doesn't even fit the context. We're not going to get anywhere like that. We're not going to get anywhere going back and re-examining the foundations. All right, now, these are people of God. We have resolved that for our discussions of today, at least. And they can't relay the foundation, and they're not doing what they should, and they're in infancy. They have fallen away, and they can't go back and start over again. It's impossible. It says so. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened if they shall fall away. They're in in verse 6. If they shall fall away, it is impossible to renew them again. You've got to go back to the first sentence of verse 4 to get that impossible. 
you see. All right, so it can't be done. They're children of God. They cannot be renewed to repentance. They are in a barren and desolate and immature condition. So what are they going to do now? If these are really children of God, and if it is really impossible to renew them again to repentance, is there any solution for the problem? Well, of course there is. It all depends on how you look at it. The apostle said the solution is just as simple as looking out the window and looking at the field. There's a field out there. It's a farmer's field. And it should bear fruit. It should bear something, because that's what it's there for. So if that field is watered, and if the ground is sufficiently furrowed so the water will sink in instead of running off of it, if it is cultivated, if it's planted, if it is dressed, what will it do? If it's good ground, if good seed is put in it and it's properly worked, what will it do? Well, it'll produce fruit, won't it? It'll produce something. Obviously it will if the conditions are right. But if it's a field that is not watered and it bakes in the sun and nobody goes out and puts any seed on it, and nobody plows it, and nobody dresses it, and nobody furrows it, and it comes along the harvest time, what will it do? What are you going to find out there in that field? If it's never watered, never planted, never plowed, never cultivated, what are you going to find in the harvest season? You're going to find some thistles? You're going to find some wild water grass? You're going to find some other useless stuff? And you say, man, we've got to get out there and cut those weeds. We've got to have a bonfire around here and get rid of that stuff. Well, of course, that's what happens to it. That's what happens to a field if it is left unattended. And that's what's the problem with with the Christian life. Leave it unattended, and what will it produce? A few old briars and thistles, and there's nothing to do but gather those things up and throw them in the fire. They're useless. Nobody wants them. God doesn't want them. We don't want them. And that's what will happen. But if you say, well, you know, uh, this is kind of silly, sitting around going hungry every year and then having to go out and cut those thistles, it'd be less work to go out there and water that field and plow it and plant something in it. And then in exchange for our efforts, we would get something to eat. And then instead of being embarrassed about that field, we could say, hey, look at my beans, look pretty good, don't they, see? And so we could have some pride about it, we could do something worthwhile about it. Well, that's what to do about a life that is immature. That's what to do about a life that is barren. Water it, plant something in it, cultivate it, and it'll produce fruit. You can count on it. It'll do it every time. And so here's these people saying, maybe I'm not even born. And God said, well, you know, I don't know where you think that's going to get you. I'll tell you what you do. Start doing something with your life. Start watering it, start plowing it, start planting in it, start cultivating your Christian character, and you'll see fruit begin to be produced, but you'll never get anywhere going back and trying to lay a foundation which has been once and for all laid. It cannot be relayed. The foundation of Christ once laid can't be relayed. When a child is born in this world, whatever he is, he'll never be born in this world again. He cannot be, that's all. You can't be, and I can't be, and despite these strange, mystic, and eastern concoctions about coming around and around until we finally get it right, that's a bunch of baloney. You'll never be born in this world again, and every sensible person knows it, see? And you'll never be born into the family of God again either. You can't be. One birth is all you get, but fortunately, one's all you need, see? The the problem is to get up and go on. That's the whole message. Now, obviously it is on several bases. One is, if we're talking about people, as some think, that we're never Christians, are we going to tell them one chance to accept the Lord is all you get? Once for all, that's it. If you don't do it once, you're out of luck. Well, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Does anybody believe that? Did you ever hear anybody seriously argue that? You tell somebody the gospel once and they don't receive it, forget them, they had their chance. Well, there's a certain principle involved there that we may warn people about, but we don't believe that that is a conclusive thing. This kind of language doesn't even fit. doesn't even fit people who aren't Christians. And if we're talking to the Christian and we're saying, well, if you ever served God and then you fell back and your hearts were hardened, and we're talking to people who had fallen away, and if you can read the last of the fifth chapter and conclude that these people hadn't, I don't know how you can do it, And if we're talking about people that have fallen away 
and we're saying nothing we can do for you, then why even dwell on the subject? Let's go on. Let's forget about it. Why give people a lecture about something they can't do? If these are people who have fallen away and renewing them again to repentance means they can't get untracked and get back with God and go along, then this is not only a contradiction of the rest of the Bible, but it's an exercise in futility. We're wasting our time. We're spinning our wheels. We're talking to people and telling them to do something and then telling them, but you can't do it. You cannot be brought back, but you ought to be. You ought to get up and go on, but I've got to tell you, you can't because it's impossible, see? Well, this is strange and confusing language. Obviously, what he is saying is there's something you can't do, but there's something you can do. And what you can't do is start over again, but what you can do is get up and go on.